it. I think that's probably long enough. And if a few more people trickle in, then it should be all right. Uh, so welcome everyone to this month's bedtime story time. Uh, my name is Ben and I'm a bookseller for Belmont Books. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar, Belmont Books is an independent and locally owned bookstore located in Belmont, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to let you know that we have a number of other virtual events uh, coming up. Next one in the series is going to be Wednesday, February 2nd at 7 p.m. It's Lon Samantha Cheng in conversation with Sue Miller. Where they'll be discussing the launch of Lon's new book, The Family Cho. You can register for our future events as well as purchase all of the books featured during tonight's uh, event at belmontbooks.com. Uh, if you have any questions for the authors and illustrators, uh, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of them as possible at the end of the event. Uh, we're very excited to welcome all of the authors and illustrators who are kind enough to join us today. Uh, we'll be introducing each before they present. And first up is Josh Crew. Uh, Josh grew up on the beaches of Florida where he spent his childhood checking out the maximum number of books allowed per week from his local library and testing the limits of what those bindings could withstand. He studied film production in college, but a fateful job at a bookstore called him back to his first love of children's books. He's an author of several books, including Oliver, the second largest living thing on earth, Jonas Hanway's scurrilous, scandalous, shockingly sensational umbrella in the book he'll be presenting to us today. Without further ado, present Josh Crute. Hey, how is everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. Um, thanks, Ben, appreciate the introduction. So yes, today we're gonna be reading Hornswoggled, which is a wacky words whodunit. So uh, I don't know about you, but I've always loved words. I really like um, words and particularly like words that are fun to say and fun to hear and fun to read, um, which is how I came up with the idea for this book. So I'll get to that in a second. So here, I just wanted to share just a few of the words that I really like, um, just to give you an idea. So I mean, you probably know the word wiggle. You know, if you're watching, you can give me a little wiggle right now. Um, but like, it's just one of those words that's like fun to say, like wiggle, you know, just comes out. Uh, and then you probably know this word too, but uh, toot, <laughs> which can mean uh, tooting a horn, but obviously it can also mean, Pfft. so if you're watching, if you give me a, Pfft, I'd appreciate it. Um, but all right, so toot is a short word, but some fun words are like really long as well. So this is a word that's actually gonna be in the book today, but it's skedaddle. So to skedaddle means to like run away quickly. You're like, let's, let's skedaddle. Like, so you're running fast. So see if you'll see that in the book today. But some words um, actually have animal words hidden inside the words. So for instance, this is another weird one. This is cattywampus, which as you see has a cat in it. Though I don't think it has anything to do with cats actually. It really just means like to have, like if I'm wearing my hat like this, I'm wearing a cattywampus. So it's sort of like off tilt. Um, but other words have animal words in them and they clearly do mean to have the animal words in them. So for instance, this is another word that'll be in the book, but it's hogwash. So if something is like complete nonsense or silliness, you're like, that's hogwash, which I guess has something to do with, you know, the water used to wash hogs or pigs. Um, but uh, another example is just one you might know, but out fox, which is another word you'll see in the book. Um, so foxes are typically known as being very clever animals. So if you outfox somebody, you're being more clever than they are. So this brings me to the title of this book, which is Hornswoggled, which is a really fun word. It's a real word. Uh, it means to be tricked or to be, um, you know, to have like a, a, a trick played on you. So like I've been hornswoggled. And uh, one thing I liked about the word is that you'll notice it even has the word horn in it, which got me thinking. It doesn't have anything to do with stealing a horn, but I thought, well, if there's a book called Hornswoggle, maybe it begins with an animal losing its horn or its antler. So this is how um, the story is going to go. So we're, this is it. This is Hornswoggled, a wacky words who done it, which is another way of saying a silly words mystery. And uh, this armadillo here in the corner is going to help us with our word definitions. So you might learn some weird new words today. And see if you can figure out uh, who is the culprit, who's the animal that's going around causing all the trouble. All right, so this is Hornswoggled, a wacky words whodunit, um, illustrated by Jen Harney. She did a great job. 
Deer knew something wasn't right. He felt lighter, uneven, less himself. But it wasn't until he looked in the mirror that he discovered the awful truth. This isn't my antler. I've been hornswoggled. Which means down here, hornswoggled means to trick. <laughs> so what did it get switched out with? Looks like a tennis racket, right? So he hoofed it over to his friend Catfish, who was doing cannonballs in the creek. Catfish, Catfish, it's gone. What is? Can't you see? Some cowardly critter stole my antler. Sorry, she said. I can't see anything without my glasses. But when she slipped them on, she discovered the awful truth. These are my glasses? What a load of codswallop. So codswallop means nonsense. So you see, what are, what are there instead of glasses? You said donuts, you're correct. <laughs> this is getting sillier and sillier. So they scurried over to Bison, who was kicking his feet up on the porch. Bison, Bison, there's a thief on the loose. A thief, he said. Let me grab my lucky boots. We'll catch up to the rascal in no time. But when he reached under his rocking chair, he discovered the awful truth. These aren't my boots. I've been buffaloed. Buffalo means to puzzle or confuse. And obviously he's a buffalo too. So they skedaddled, there's that word, they skedaddled over to the mayor who was playing croquet with his cabinet. You can see them over here, these very important looking animals. Mayor, mayor, some villainous varmint is stealing our stuff. That's terrible, awful, offensively egregious. Fortunately, I've penned a prize winning speech which will lift up our spirits in these dark times. Can you see who's in the background, hidden in the background? Who's that? Could be an animal causing mischief. But when he reached into his vest pocket, he discovered the awful truth. This isn't my speech. This is poppycock, which means nonsense. But then we also have humbug, snake oil, horse feathers, hogwash, which means more nonsense, way more nonsense. Is this even a word? So much nonsense. Yep, and who's hidden in the back again? Attendez, it is I, famous Belgian detective Pierre Mouffet. This is not how we solve le mystery. We must look for clues. We must use logic. We must put on our thinking caps. Can you guess what's gonna happen? <laughs> and who's this in the background? This isn't my thinking cap. I've been skunked. So what's he got on his, it looks like a piece of pie, right? Someone told us stole his thinking cap. To skunk means to cheat. It's a crime spree. No one is safe. Where do we run now? Crash. Then they discovered the awful truth. Hey, that's my antler and my glasses and my boots and my speech and my thinking cap. Fox bowed with a flourish. It is true, she said. It was I who took your things, for I am the greatest trickster in the world. I have hoodwinked emperors and snookered kings. I have bamboozled princes and outwitted queens. Why, just last week, I swapped out the crown jewels with a bag of marbles. Here, let me show you. So we have hoodwink means to trick, snooker means to trap, bamboozle means to cheat, and outwit means to outsmart. But where's Armadillo going? But when she reached into her fanny pack, she discovered the awful truth. These aren't the crown jewels. I've been outfoxed. Outfoxed means to beat someone at their own game. The end. <laughs> so ultimately, Fox was stealing all this stuff, but the armadillo outfoxed the fox. So that's Hornswoggled. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, it was a lot of fun discovering all those really fun words. And um, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. Thanks so much for sharing, Josh. I really love that you don't shy away from hard words, because I think a lot of people, when they think of kids' books, they're like, oh, we'll make it easy. We'll have basic. But I think that having the armadillo is with the definitions like really clever way to 
kind of challenge kids and expose them to a lot of fun new words that I'm sure teachers will be very confused around the playground here. <laughs> yeah, that's my ultimate goal is to like, if I could just get a bunch of kids running around the houses yelling hornswoggled and cod swallop. Uh, it's time to skedaddle, I'll, mom. <laughs> yeah, I will have done. No, I mean, I, I agree with you. I loved words mm -hmm. growing up. And so I, every new word, like if you ever read the book, The Phantom Tollbooth, there's, they describe like a marketplace where there's like words you can try and taste and eat. And that's kind of how I felt whenever I was learning a new word. It was like a new food almost like, oh, this new with the sound and the meaning and everything. Mm -hmm. so, I think Hornswoggled is definitely going to instill that same love in a new generation. <laughs> All right, uh, next up, we have uh, Christopher Miner. Uh, Christopher is a lifelong music and cat lover who cites the impact of children's literature as an impetus to become a picture book author himself. Uh, when he's not writing, he's either playing guitar, watching baseball, or listening to records. Once upon a time, Christopher had a music-loving kitten, uh, Lily, who would be mesmerized as the two of them listened to records together. An avid supporter of local businesses in both life and literature, we're thrilled to have Christopher with us today. Chris might be a little bit frozen, but <laughs> fingers crossed. Well, there is a blizzard, right? <laughs> There's a blizzard, it's chilly out. If not, might switch gears. We'll give him a minute or two and might have to audible and <laughs> go to it. Oh. Oh. He's probably like jumping off and seeing if he can jump back on. Yeah, let's do an audible uh, switch over to Emily and then we'll have, uh, hopefully Chris can join us and then he can take us home. Uh, so unfortunately, um, the author, in, uh, Amy, uh, Emily is the illustrator and the author won't be joining us tonight, um, but we do have Emily with us. Uh, Emily Boone is an illustrator or author illustrator of more than 20 books for children. Born in the Netherlands, Emily spent most of her childhood in California and Mexico. It was in Mexico that she discovered her artistic eye and love of color a talent and passion that she further developed while studying at the Royal Academy of Art at The Hague. In addition to her illustrious publishing career, Emily visits elementary schools and holds workshops to teach young children about the process of writing and illustrating picture books. Present Emily. Hi everyone. Hello, my friends. I'm really delighted to be here with you today. And along with authors Josh Crute and Christopher Miner. And Josh, that was a lot of fun. I loved uh, hearing your book. That's a great, uh, fun read aloud. Um, yeah, so I'm actually an author and an illustrator. And for this book, We Want Snow, which I do have right here. Um, I was the illustrator and Jamie Swenson wrote the, uh, the words. And I have to say, I can't believe what a perfect day it is to read this book. Um, because out my window here in the Boston area, we are having a big, big blizzard. And so this book is about we want snow. So yeah, I think it's pretty perfect. And uh, I know that not all of you are here in the Boston area, or, although I'm sure some of you are, like Ben and Chris and maybe others. Um, but so no matter, you know, maybe you're somewhere really warm and sunny and, and lucky you, although we can have some fun here in the snow too. But no matter where you are, hope you'll have fun and get some ideas about how to play in the snow both uh, real and imaginary. So um, I've got the book here, as I said, but I think I also have it on my uh, screen so that I can show that to you. And I'm going to share my screen um, and hopefully get this going for you. Okay, so here we go. We want snow. Um, by Jamie A. Swenson and Emily Boone. And we can see the pictures, right? Just checking. Yes, great. Okay, not a flake, not a flake, not a flip-flop flake. We've been waiting all year for goodness sake. 
snow, snow, we want snow, up to our ankles, up to our shins, up to our knees, up to our chins. We want hills covered in white for slipping and sliding and sledding all night. We want friends of every, snow friends of every size with carrots for noses and charcoal for eyes. We want snow forts and ice skating too. We'll play outside till our noses are blue. We want snowballs flying high, a kid made blizzard filling the sky. Snow, snow, we want snow. Up to our ankles, up to our shins, up to our knees, up to our chins. We want mittens, woolly and warm, mountains of mittens fit for a storm. We want cocoa piping hot with cream and marshmallows we want a lot. We want fire crackling and glowing while outside a storm is howling and blowing, just like here. We want winter stories filling our heads and cozy comforters piled up on our beds. Snow, snow, we want snow up to our ankles, up to our shins, up to our knees, up to our chins. But there's not a flake, not a flake, not a flip-flop flake. No skates, no mittens, no hats or boots, no scarves, no sleds, no puffy snow suits. Wait, is that, could it be a tiny, shiny, shimmering flake? And another, and another? Hooray, snow, snow, we have snow up to our ankles, up to our shins, up to our knees, up to our chins. Whoa, brr, too much snow. Snow in our hats, snow in our hair, snow in our socks and underwear. So spring, spring, we want spring, hooray. And that is the end. So as you can see, thank you, that is a, a chant, a wintry chant. Um, so I would also love to tell you a little bit about how I came to make this book. And there are a lot of different steps involved when you're illustrating a book. But the most important thing I think is that we uh, start with our imaginations. Of course, the authors like Josh and Chris also start with their imaginations. But there are other parts to making a book uh, once you've got off to uh, using your imagination. So I'd love to share. Uh, again, I'm going to show you some pictures of, of a lot of the different steps um, that I went through to make this book. So let's see. Um, I'm going to actually share my screen again. Just got to get to the right place. And find the right. Oh, actually, that reminds me. Hold on one sec. Um, I was actually quickly going to show you my actual real sketchbook, which I have here because really all my work starts in my sketchbook, just like probably for Josh and Chris, things start in a notebook or maybe on the back of an envelope or something. Um, for me, things start in my sketchbook. So I just thought I would show you a couple of those of these sketches that I've got. Um, these are the characters. I, they don't look exactly like the characters in the book yet, but hopefully you can recognize something that stayed the same. So maybe one more right here. All right, and now I'll jump back into the slideshow um, and share my screen. Okay, there we go. So I think you're seeing the one with the uh, snow bunny uh, that I had in my sketchbook. and. Uh, what I do is what I do all the sketches in a lot of, not all, a lot of sketches in my sketchbook. I take photos of them and I put them on my computer and then I can clean them up a little bit and change them a little. And I don't know if you notice anything that's different with this sketch, but what do you, is it still the snow bunny? No, we've got more of a classic snow friend or snow person or snowman, whatever you want to call it. So um, 
you can see that as I go along, I make changes. Again, here are the characters that you just saw in my sketchbook. I've cleaned them up and now um, getting to know them even because these are the characters that I'm going to be working with. When I came up with these in my sketchbook, I really liked them and I thought, um, you know, I think I'm, I think these are the ones that some, sometimes they come quickly, sometimes you have to go through a lot of different steps, but uh, these characters showed up pretty quickly. Once I've got my characters figured out, it's time for me to start working on my color, and I like to use watercolors, so these might not be all exactly the colors that I use, but this is something like what my palette might look like, some of the tools that I use, my brushes, I have water, some paints are in tubes, some paints are like in the little containers, just like you use, um, and then I start to mix colors and I am really trying different colors to make swatches um, and this helps me to decide which colors I want to use for the whole book. So mixing a couple of colors, you can see it's not like I have like 50 colors to pick from. I like to pick maybe like seven or eight colors at the most and all the colors that you see I would mix from those um, basic colors. I also have to figure out the skin tones for my characters and once I've finished making my little swatches and experimenting and find the colors I like, it's a little bit like finding a formula and I have to try and stick to that so that my characters stay recognizable. Uh, so again, once I've got the skin tones and the, the, the character, the, the pencil lines, then I start to figure out what their outfits look like and which colors I'm going to use for their outfits. So that's all a lot of fun. I, I want each character, in this case, I wanted each one to be distinctive and look different. But on the other hand, they I wanted them to still work together as a group as well, because they're always hanging out as a group in the book. Um, and your, then your slides I don't seem to be advancing. They're not advancing. No, I think we're we're still on the first one. Oh, yeah, I think I think it's not in uh, like uh, it's sort of like on the main thing and not in the actual like PowerPoint. No, oh, okay, so we can see the the first sketch, but it's we can okay, kind of see the whole so, thing. Oops. All right. So thanks for letting me know. Um, let's see. Let's see. If, are you seeing something different now? Or no, no? It's still it's still just the first where they're making All right, the snow I bunny. Guess Either I'm going to get out and do the, uh, what's it called? I can get try and get in one more time, or maybe I'll, um, I'll try something simpler since I could end up with some trouble here. So um, I'm going to try something else, which, but first I guess, yes, back to screen share. Where's my Zoom? Zoom, Zoom, here we go screen share. Oh, I'm sorry you couldn't see all the colors, but let's see. Um, I'm going to share this time. Yeah, uh, it's now. Oh, are you seeing the same thing? Well, I see the snowman. Like okay. The snow. uh, all right. Hold on. I didn't get into what I... Are, is this changing now? Now it's... Yeah, it's changing now. Uh, all <laughs> right. So now I'm going to kind of move through. These were the characters, so all the different characters. Uh, my paints, mm. my swatches, my skin colors that I'm making with, uh, you know, I'm trying to make a little formula so I can always have the same ones. And now I'm making notes and trying to figure out what outfits I want to use for my characters. So, and then once I've got the characters, um, I start to put them, you know, back into a situation like with the snowman is, can everyone see that? The snowman we're still seeing? Okay, I'm just going to assume yes. Yes, yes, we can see <laughs> All right, okay. And then that I, I also have to figure out the setting of the whole story. So I've got the city setting. I make, this was one of the first sketches that I did uh, for the city um, because where the children live in the, in the reality part of the book is, is in the city. Um, and then of course I have, I did a lot of different snowy pictures for the snowy, background um, for the kind of the magical part of the book where they're really using their imaginations and I did a lot of different backgrounds to start but this one I liked because I felt like it really had a magical feeling it reminded me of a forest where it's just finished snowing and everything is glistening and um, so I I decided to use this as the main um, 
example, even just for myself, really, because mostly I'm just doing this um, at this point for myself. And then on my computer, like I told you before, I can put things together quickly. So I could put the characters and the snowman and the background together and get an idea of what the book could look like. And then once I figured that out, I really need to know, I think because I'm a very visual person and I like to illustrate and make pictures, um, even when I'm writing my own stories, I like to get the some of the visuals down first. But once I've got that, then I start working on the rough sketches for all the pages in my book. And this is just to get, a, again, it's just to be able to see what could the book look like here are the characters you know waiting for snow do they look exactly uh like the characters in the book probably probably not right are you oh did we just bounce out of that again all right let's see yeah okay okay great um so they don't um where was i Oh, not there. Actually, I was right here, believe it. Yeah, right yep. here. All right, so that was one page. And then here, they're running into their imaginary world. Um, so again, is it, it you know, the, the trees are starting to come in front of the buildings, kind of giving the suggestion that things are changing and their imaginations are kind of taking over. But again, they're really rough sketches. You can see they're just kind of almost like scribbly sketches just to get an idea of what the book will look like. Um, here, I feel like they're like sledding full steam ahead into the imaginary world. Um, and I also sprinkled in for all the imaginary parts, Arctic animals. You can see the little um, Arctic fox in the background. I had, oh, sorry, Arctic uh, hair, but I had, had an Arctic fox and a snowy owl. You might have noticed that in the artwork. And here is the picture coming back to the snowman, the snow friend. Um, you can see that in the end, I put back the snow bunny, but over on the side. Um, so of course, I have to do lots more pages. Um, I'm not going to show them all to you now because once I finish the whole all the rough sketches, then it's time to think about the cover of the book. So here's one of the covers of the book. Does this look exactly like the cover of the book? No, I don't think so. Um, but I did a lot. I had a lot of different choices. So this one it was this, the title page that you saw before, but. The people that I worked with, the art director and the editor, they kind of liked it and they thought that would be a possibility. But we ke I kept on drawing and gave them lots of different choices. I don't know which one is your favorite, um, but here is one that's pretty close to the final. What do you think? Um, but there is something missing. So look really carefully. Do you see anything that's missing? Ah, the dog. You're right. The dog is missing. And don't you think the cover with the dog makes it look even better? I think so. Um, well, once I finished all the rough sketches for every page of the book and I got it okayed by my art director and my editor, they said, go ahead. Then I have to go, go back and really just like at the beginning, I start making the sketches again, but this time it's my final line. So here are the final lines for uh, one of the pieces of my artwork. And um, there's a lot of blank space and that's good. I'm just gonna fill that all in with watercolor. Um, but each painting is so different, like with different uh, things happening with different colors um, that I actually have to do a lot of experimenting again for each page and practice so that the techniques that I want to use uh, will, will work out for each different page. And you can see, I wanted to add textures. I tried out different ways of making the pine trees. I even sprinkled a little salt into the wet paint to get that kind of snowing effect. Uh, so once I've done that, and I feel like I really know exactly how I want to use my watercolors, then I start working on my final artwork. I take that page that I showed you before with the final lines and I start slowly adding in the paint. And of course, um, there are lots of steps, even with this. I have some paints, you have to let them dry before you put the next one. Sometimes you put them in wet. Um, so do you think I did this in just a couple of minutes? 
no, even just this one page took me at least a day or two of painting and doing the lines. So um, you can see that it can take a long time. There are a lot of steps to make to illustrate a book. I had to make another 17 paintings like this. So um, you, now you, you know all the different steps there are to illustrating a book. And I think I will uh, leave it at that. Um, I do have the original artwork here that I could quickly show you just so you can see kind of how big this is. And because um, it looks a little different when it's just on the screen. So you can see when I hold it up, you can really see some of the details, some of the salt that I sprinkled up there in the sky. And uh, like, let's see some of the others animals you see the arctic fox hang up kind of hiding back there so that's it my friends i hope you enjoyed um seeing a little bit about um how i illustrate my books and especially this book um so thanks for listening thanks so much emily and thank you for sharing your creative process as well as that beautiful book uh, I especially liked just kind of how soft and inviting the illustrations were. Like it really reminded me of like being a kid and jumping into that snowbank and just um, also with, with Jamie's words, it really captured the kind of exuberance of that excitement of like looking outside or like your mom tells you it's a snow day, you don't have to go to school. Like, so I think yeah. beautiful job and you know, glad that the weather came out for you. And, uh, yeah, thank you. And I just want to say to all my friends, like, I know it's probably getting dark out by now, but maybe by tomorrow, you can have a lot of fun out there, build some snow forts, and who knows what else. I'm sure you'll use your imagination and have fun. Thank you. Thank you. And suspense has been building up for this. Uh, <laughs> happy to present Chris. Fingers crossed that the uh, internet gods have been appeased and they will let us hear his story. <laughs> and I uh, already introduced him, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris. <laughs> uh, you seem to be muted, though. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for hosting us, Belmont Books, on the snowy day. Uh, thank you to Josh and Emily. Your stories were great. I really enjoyed uh, seeing the, you know, your creative process and hearing your stories. It was wonderful. So to get started, my story is called Lily's Grooves and it was illustrated by Katrina Ostapovitz who really captured the essence of a cat I used to own named Lily. Now quickly before I get the story started, I'm gonna tell you a little story about Lily. I had Lily about five years ago. I was living in an apartment in Brighton and Lily was my best friend at the time. So I have a picture of her right here. She's adorable. So one day we were having a storm. It wasn't quite as bad as this one, but it was nasty out there. We had at least a foot of snow and streets were covered. You couldn't see out the window. And Lily was just perched on the windowsill. She kept jumping out to the window. She kept jumping up and she wanted to go out in the snow. But even with all that fur, it was way too cold for her to go out there. So she wouldn't calm down. She was bouncing from the bed to the shelf to the window to look out at the snow. She wanted to roll around and catch snowflakes on her tongue. So what I did, we had to get her to calm down. I made her some kitty food. I poured her some water and I put on some music. And as soon as the music started, Lily was just cool and calm. And she sat and washed the snow and listened to the music. So that brings us to Lily's Grooves, which is inspired by Lily and it's how Music can bring peace. Harry and Ed Simon sat down to breakfast. The big day had finally arrived. Their new music shop, Grooves, was celebrating its grand opening. There was just one little problem. Ed, now that we will be gone all day, Carrie asked with concern, what will we do with herself? The Simon's wild kitten Lily could not be left home alone. She had a habit of turning every room into a terrible mess. Suddenly, a feline flash flew across the table. 
Lily, no, cried Ed and Carrie as the kitten tumbled over the cereal bowls, lapping up all the milk she could. We just can't leave her alone all day, Ed groaned as he and Carrie cleaned up the spill. Once Carrie turned on the radio, however, a calm came over Lily. Ed remarked that he had never seen the bouncy kitten so mellow. It must be the music, Carrie observed. She suggested that they bring Lily to Grooves for the day. Although they worried about their kitty causing trouble at the store, they knew she would be safe under their watchful eyes. The Simons agreed to bring Lily to the shop, hoping the music would help her behave. Lily smiled and purred with excitement. Look how mellow she is now that the music is playing. When Carrie and Ed arrived at Grooves, they set up a cozy corner where Lily could rest. Just then, a dark shadow came over the store. The building owner, Mr. Donald, loomed in the doorway. He was not pleased. You guys had better keep the noise down in here, he demanded. Without warning, a blur of fur dashed across the floor, landing right on the angry businessman's shoes. You can't have a wild, unruly kitten here in my building, fumed Mr. Donald. If she causes any damage in here, your store is closed. The Simons thought they were in serious trouble. They put on some music to help Lily relax after Mr. Donald blustered out the door. Later that afternoon, business was booming. Grooves was packed with music lovers from far and wide. Lily strolled around, gracefully greeting the customers. She was as cool and calm as a kitten could be. When Mr. Donald returned at the end of the day, Grooves was perfectly neat and tidy. Lily was napping peacefully in her corner. Carrie explained that Lily had been well-behaved all day and attracted dozens of customers to the store. I shall suppose she can stay, sighed Mr. Donald, as long as you three don't cause any trouble. Carrie and Ed decided to rename their shop Lily's Grooves for their beloved kitten who found her peace through the power of song. Lily woke up from her nap and purred in approval. And that's the end. And if you have a copy of Lily's Grooves, there's a space right at the end where you can write the name of a song that makes you feel peaceful. So you notice how once the music was playing, Lily was just calm and peaceful and everyone wanted to come to the store to buy their music, but more importantly, to see Lily. And some of the inspiration for this story was that when I had Lily, I had a record player in my apartment and every time if she would get wild and crazy and rambunctious and run around after she had her breakfast, she would sit right on top of the plastic cover of the record player and just sit there and watch it spin around. And she would be so peaceful and mellow. She'd sit right next to you as I was listening to music and we'd have great times checking out new albums together. And I'm sure if anybody here has a cat, they can relate to the cat being either very mellow and sweet and just bouncing off the walls and going crazy. So next time, play one of your favorite songs for your cat. And I'm sure they'll really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing, Chris. I truly found a great muse in Lily. He produced a beautiful book and a wonderful story. Oh, oh thank you. Does uh, did Lily have a favorite genre or eclectic taste? <laughs> You know, the good thing about Lily is when I picked when I picked out Lily, I could tell we had the same music taste. So we both love, you know, 90s rock. We loved classic rock. I mean, we were both we were both big Pearl Jam fans. And of course, we loved all the classics, you know, the Beatles and the Who and Bob Dylan and all those you know, classic bands. We loved Pearl Jam. We loved Soundgarden. 
Uh, there's a band out of Portland called Slater Kinney that we both loved. And there's a little Easter egg. The two human characters, Ed and Carrie, are named after two of my favorite musicians, who are Eddie Vedder and Carrie Brownstein. <laughs> so I figured, you know, the records that Lily listened to, they can live on in the book through some mm -hmm. of our favorite bands. You know, if you're going to have a kitten, it's really important they share your musical taste. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And, uh, thank you, everyone, for presenting today. Um, I think we'll have a few time for questions, though. It seems like the, the crowd was shy. Uh, so I'll start things off and curious, kind of what, what book do you remember from your childhood that like, has made a big impact because that would seem to be one of the commonalities that everyone kind of wanted to put that book that is that special book for someone else. I was wondering what that was for each of you. Um, a big one for me, I mentioned it already, but the Phantom Tollbooth, it's one of my favorite. It's for, it's for a little bit older than a picture book age. It's like for eight to 12 year olds, but mm -hmm. um, it's all about just how wonderful it is to like learn and to live and to pay attention to what you're doing. And, and there's just so many, it's just really funny and uh, really imaginative the way it goes about it. And it, it takes a lot of ideas and makes them concrete, like, like eating, you know, the taste of words or there's an island of conclusions that you get to by jumping, or there's a, a symphony that like plays the the or um like there's an orchestra that plays the comfort uh, the colors of the world not music and which just gets you to notice things in a different way and that's in the story milo at the beginning is very bored and he comes and he goes on this adventure and he comes home and you, you think he would want to go back to the cool fantasy world but he's like actually there's so much to do right here and it transforms the world around him and the book has a very similar reaction where you read the book and you want to read it again you want to go back to the lands beyond but then you look around and you realize oh my gosh there's so much to do right right here right now i gotta go read other books and write write things and go for walks and that that's a big one that um something just something about some of the ideas in there and a sense, the sense of humor pops up in a lot of things i do oh beautiful message what about uh chris or emily so i have oh, two of my favorite books growing up no surprise involved cats there was one I think this was the official title, but it's going back a while away. There's the one called The Firehouse Cat, and it was about a cat who lived in a firehouse. And I remember that was a really early favorite. And then there was one in the old I Can Read series, the little paperbacks we used to get, called Scruffy. And it was about a boy who adopted a cat from an animal shelter. And I remember reading that just as I was learning how to read, maybe around three, four years old, around preschool. And it was about this fluffy white kitten. So I just remember the theme of cats and animals and stories that show off the intuition of animals in relation to their humans and how they ha can have the exact same amount of intelligence and emotion. And of course, the Peanuts comics where Snoopy just towers over everyone and he it just <laughs> carries the story. So mm -hmm. seeing the animals carry the whole story was always uh, a lot very entertaining for me. <laughs> yeah, and for me, I, I have a couple different, but one of them is a... Uh, I wish I had it right here on my bookshelf. It's actually in another room, but it was a book of nursery. I'm from Holland originally, and it was a book of nursery rhymes that my grandmother had given to me, but it was originally written in Czech and it was, the illustrations were just gorgeous. Uh, Zabransky is his last name. I'm having a blank on his first name, but that book truly inspired me just even to this day I, I can't it in terms of the illustrations the art really I just still carry that book with me and then in terms of stories I think I really really I think I must have been so excited when I learned to read myself even though I know I had you know obviously parents or someone else reading to me I really have these very strong fond memories of the Dr. Seuss books like the early readers you know really like the cat in the hat and just all those classics I, I think I just was very happy to be able to read by myself and they're funny I think like Josh says I don't think that my work is necessarily funny but I definitely appreciate that humor and the illustrations were also always you know of course Dr. Seuss what can we say so yeah th those are my two uh favorites oh, wonderful um, thank you all so much for sharing today I'm 
can't wait for the future generation to look back on Hornswoggled, We Want Snow, and Lily's Grooves as those books that really, you know, they remember fondly and make an impact. And I think they they all certainly sure will be that for, for kids. Um, so just want to thank everyone again. Uh, we will be posting this on our YouTube page if anyone wants to listen to, if anyone didn't have the chance, you know, in your life that might love to hear some stories, uh, feel free to share. And uh, until then, uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Thanks so, so much. For, Thanks so much, guys. Thanks Great for stories to Josh nice and Emily. Nice to meet you, uh, Josh nice and Chris. Meet Chris. Great, Great to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good luck in the snow. <laughs> you too. <laughs>